This is a night of new beginnings. For tonight, our community is born anew. The presence, the promise, and the passions of the class of 2020 call us all to claim again who we are and what we are for. Who we are is a multi-disciplined, multicultural, multi-faith community committed to knowledge and wisdom, civility and compassion, justice and care. This is a night of new beginnings. And in these days to come, may we create brave spaces to become our best selves, ask our most urgent questions, discover our greatest aspirations, and may we do this work together with gratitude and joy. You may be seated. Hello, class of 2020. Hi. My name is Eric Jensen. This is the start of my first full year here at Illinois Wesleyan as president. So like you, I'm new here myself. I live just across Park Street with my wife, Elizabeth, and a local celebrity, our dog, Calvin. I've met some of you as I was walking the dog, or today, while you were moving in, <coughs> excuse me, or elsewhere around campus. And I look forward to meeting each of you as we see each other around this wonderful campus. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. It's a time of extraordinary change for each of you. You've been hearing about it, thinking about it, and with your parents planning for it for years. Now it's here. It's exciting, maybe a little bit scary, and the opening of whole new chapters of your lives for each of you. It's a great privilege for all of us here, my colleagues on the faculty and staff, not just on this stage, but across campus, to share this exciting time with you. This is a place to ask hard questions, and as a result, discover deep truths. The hallmark of a liberal arts education is a focus on critical thinking and problem solving. In your time here, you will be challenged. It's our obligation as faculty and staff to ensure that each of you is asked not just to work hard, but to think, to challenge your own assumptions, and to be able to argue your conclusion persuasively. It's our obligation to ensure that each of you is equipped with the tools of inquiry, inquiry civil discourse, and debate. Through this, you are empowered to engage ideas through logic, not raw emotion, through facts, not fear, and through inquiry, not bluster. You'll grow over your time here, and you'll leave here a different person than you are today. You'll likely experience academic, performing, athletic, and other successes. You'll make lifetime friends, and perhaps find life partners. You'll be intellectually challenged by the faculty, by staff, and importantly, by each other. Words like growth, change, and challenge all suggest exciting and interesting times. Hmm, in interesting times. Well, Robert Kennedy said in his famous Ripple of Hope speech to students at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, struggling with apartheid in 1966, that comfort is not the road history has marked out for us. There's a Chinese curse that says, may he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. Kennedy was right. We, too, live in interesting times. The challenge we face is in finding our way as a community to talking about those things that we need to talk about in ways that draw upon both our shared respect of our common bonds and our intellectual tradition of free speech and open inquiry. So yes, you'll work, but today you're embarking not just on a period of challenge, but on a period of your life that's just plain fun. You're starting on a wonderful interlude in each of your lives, a truly special time. Make new friends, do new things, learn and grow wise. Before I go, let's talk in a very tight nest tradition established by my predecessor a little bit about learning and growing wise. The science fiction writer Frank Herbert said, the beginning of knowledge is the discovery of something we do not understand. Nice. And we all know that knowledge is power. <coughs> But the historian Will Durant said, knowledge is power, but only wisdom is liberty. 
Choices, choices. If we had to choose one or the other, knowledge or wisdom, which would it be? Well, how about it? Who's for knowledge? <laughs> Two of you? Oh, there's some upstairs. Good, I'll find them. And, and how about wisdom? And the rest of you are, the rest of you want both, right? Because neither is not an option, right? Okay. So here comes that Titan tradition. If you chose knowledge, or because there's a few of it with those hands up, if you chose both knowledge and wisdom, repeat with gusto after me. Ciencia. Ciencia. If you choose wisdom, or again like both qualities, repeat also with gusto after me. Sapiencia. Sapiencia. And again, the first group. The first group. <laughs> You'll grow wiser, my friend. The first group. Sapiencia. 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 Okay. I like that. I bet many of you are saying both words already. Let's join them together with it. And say the only Wesleyan motto. Ready? One, two, three. Ciencia. Now. something I want to pivot to is about the theme. A lot of you may have heard the theme is women's power, women's justice. Now, women's rights are a very, very important part of diversity. And diversity is something that is very important to Illinois Wesleyan's campus. It's something that is truly a part of what this university stands for. It's important to think about what the different aspects of ourselves that we have, whether that be our, our racial background, whether that be our religious background, our financial background, or merely what area we're from. I mean, I'm from a small farm town. I'm sure a lot of you are from the Chicagoland area. But it's important to think about those differences whenever we have discussions and debate with one another. It's important to remember what our roots are and where we came from. And it's important to not only celebrate those differences, but also to challenge those differences and challenge differences of opinion from our backgrounds. But it's important to challenge others' views without challenging them as a person. I just want to thank you for your time, and I hope to get the chance to meet with you, all of you, and work with all of you in the future. Thank you.
Alexa and Nancy, thank you so much. What a wonderful way to start our year. It is my privilege to welcome our new students on behalf of the faculty. You chose a great university, and congratulations, a great university chose you. For more than a century and a half, Illinois Wesleyan has uniquely integrated the traditions of a liberal arts college with professional education, first in the fine and performing arts, and then in education, business, accounting, and nursing. The early leaders of the university made these distinctive decisions because they recognized the need for liberally educated leaders in professional life. We need liberally educated citizen leaders more than ever before. Many institutions excel in preparing students to think critically, to write persuasively, and to lead compassionately. This is the, the collective rhetoric of all premier liberal arts colleges. We do these things more effectively than any other sector of higher education. It is not hyperbole, it is irrefutably true. And yet we struggle daily to fend off wave after wave of contrarian media, without mention of our most critical assets. We are where young men and women can best learn to have difficult conversations. We talk about being educated broadly and deeply. We want you to have a comprehensive appreciation of the breadth of learning and we will help you to develop the discipline to achieve a rich understanding of a field of learning that must be accumulated and cultivated over time. These experiences are not a goal unto themselves. The breadth and depth of your education at Illinois Wesleyan is intended to prepare you to think across disciplines, cultures, and times to see how the Gordian knots of our greatest social, scientific, and moral challenges might be untied. This is the modern cradle of hope, and it is how we make manifest our mission to afford the greatest possibilities for realizing individual potential while preparing students for democratic citizenship and life in a global society. Each year, the faculty and staff identify an intellectual theme that allows our community collectively to learn to have these difficult conversations in a form of mutual respect with intentional opportunity for reflection and personal development. As you know, this year's theme is women's power, women's justice. I was disappointed to hear that during pre-orientation, some of our male athletes had ridiculed this theme as frivolous and irrelevant, which is exactly why this theme is timely and necessary. These are the nine leading issues affecting women around the world today as identified by Global Citizen. One, inadequate access to education. According to UNESCO, 31 million girls of primary school age are not in school. Two, inequality in the workforce. The United States, a nation that regularly declares itself a leader in equity and human rights, women are paid less than men across nearly all employment sectors. In 2015, the differential was 21%. Even though women began outnumbering men on college campuses in the 1980s, and in 2014, women in the US surpassed men in overall academic achievement. Three, reproductive rights and health. Worldwide, 225 million women lack family planning resources. Four, maternal health. The World Health Organization estimates that nearly 300,000 lives are lost each year from preventable pregnancy-related causes. Five, gender-based violence. The World Health Organization reports that one in three women will experience physical or sexual violence. Six, 
Child marriage. According to the United Nations Population Fund, during this decade, over 140 million girls will be child brides. Seven, female genital mutilation. The World Health Organization estimates that over 200 million women and girls have been victims of these practices across 30 nations. Eight, female infanticide. Globally, when left to nature, human beings have an even distribution of men and women through what is known as Fisher's Principle. Women generally live longer, but this is balanced by a slightly higher male birth rate, 107 male births for every 100 female. When the World Bank first collected global population data by gender in 1961, the world population was within 0.09% of gender equilibrium. A gap has continued to grow since that time so that there are now over 60 million more men than women in the world. Much of this can be attributed to female infanticide and male-dominated culture. And nine, political inequality. 95% of the world's nations have a male head of state. This Friday marks the 96th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which finally granted U.S. women the right to vote, and yet until last month, no major party had nominated a woman to be their candidate for president. I had said these were the leading issues affecting women, but we are all affected. As Dr. King wrote in his letter from Birmingham jail, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Women's power, women's justice is justice. As Marie Shear so poignantly wrote, feminism is the radical notion that women are people. I urge each of you to take every occasion this year to use this theme as a springboard for developing your skill at having difficult conversations, the conversations that really matter. This will prepare you to be that difference you wish to see in the world. Learn to become better advocates for your mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, and friends, and for those who cannot speak for themselves, and ultimately, for yourselves. This is what it means to realize your greatest individual potential for democratic citizenship and life in a global society. This is what it means to be a Titan. This summer, you read Jenny Nordberg's Underground Girls of Kabul, which in its exploration of Baka Posh, elucidates one of the countless threads in complex web of women's power, women's justice. Ms. Nordberg will be on this stage on September 14th as the keynote speaker for the President's Convocation. Incoming students were invited to submit entries for an essay contest about the reading, and I get to announce them now. The first prize is an invitation for dinner at the President's house with Jenny Nordberg in a $250 uh, bookstore gift card, and two honorable mention prizes, also invitation to the dinner with Ms. Nordberg, and $100 IWU bookstore gift card. The first prize winner for her essay, Differences Between Afghan and American Gender Politics, Subtle Versus Blatant Sexism and Both Their Dangers, is by Mary Amanda Breeden. Ms. Breeden, will you please stand and be recognized? I missed my dog, 
I miss my mom's cooking, my family support system, and especially my high school friends, who I didn't think I could live without. I was very worried that I wouldn't fit in and that somebody in the admissions office would figure out that I really didn't belong there. Back in those days, first year students were not informed in advance where we would live on campus or who our roommate would be. So when I finally located my room, I was astonished to discover that my roommate was a young woman from much farther away than I was. Her name was Boyce, and she was from Ghana, West Africa. When we introduced ourselves, I remember thinking to myself, I know absolutely nothing about Africa, and we both have absolutely nothing in common. As it turned out, she knew very little about me or my background either and was just as nervous about having someone so different as her roommate. Over time, I learned that Lois is a member of a royal family among the Ashante ethnic group, a real princess. And she turned and she learned that I'm adopted, something that took quite a long time for her to fully understand. She shared stories about growing up in Accra, the busy capital city of Ghana, and I shared stories about growing up on the Mississippi River in a small town in Minnesota. At first, it seemed we couldn't be more different, but in just a matter of weeks, we became good friends. So that I could learn more about the fascinating continent where Joyce lived, I enrolled in an African history course that first semester. Lois's story became the first of dozens of African stories I learned during my years in college. And that background led me to study African history and then <coughs> anthropology in graduate school, travel to Africa for my studies, and eventually marry an African and make a second home there. Befriending Lois completely changed my perspective on my studies, on my understanding of the world, and on my life's path. Our ability to reach across what seemed to be a great divide of difference between us and to get to know and understand one another was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It totally rocked my world. In the Introduction to Cultural Anthropology course that I teach, I try my best to encourage my students to rock their worlds. Each of them selects a different group on campus to study anthropologically, be it a social club, a sports team, a religious organization, a music group, or one of the many registered student organizations on campus. After receiving institutional review board approval and permission from the group's leader, the students observe and participate in group activities, interview a member of the group, and work collaboratively with group members to discover what makes the group tick. Some students find the ethnographic research project to be very challenging. It requires them to reach across seemingly great divides of difference that separate them from members of the group under study. They worry especially about the first meeting they attend, when they introduce themselves in front of strangers and explain why they want to learn more about the group. When they are asked, why did you leave your cozy dorm room, disrupt your busy schedule, stray from your regular routine, take a break from friends you've already made, and venture into unfamiliar territory to get to know us, they need to be able to discuss their genuine interest in the group not simply their need to complete a class assignment. That wouldn't go over very well. So each student has to decide upon a group she or he is genuinely interested in learning more about, a group of people who are truly mysterious, in a good way, in an intriguing way, and in a way that will motivate them to become an outsider for a while. Making ourselves vulnerable as outsiders in this way helps us recognize our mutual vulnerability. The fact that when we are surrounded by friends or people who look like us, speak our language, and have a lot in common with us, there are people right next to us who are not with their friends, who speak another language, and do not feel at home. When we go out on a limb to connect with new people, we become more aware of people who are trying to connect with us. Having an awareness of mutual vulnerability is an important aspect of what philosopher Maureen Linker refers to as intellectual empathy, a powerful tool that can facilitate critical yet empathetic examination of beliefs and feelings about self and others in order to recognize social biases, ethnocentricities, 
and structural inequalities that perpetuate social injustice and divide us from each other. My challenge to you this semester is to go out of your way to meet students you might not naturally be inclined to befriend, join organizations, take classes, and attend campus events focused on people you don't know much about and on experiences that seem foreign and perhaps even a little strange. Convince your roommate to go to a campus event that you're interested in and go to a campus event that your roommate is interested in. You know, never know which of these activities will rock your world. I challenge you to make the IWU campus your laboratory for testing your ability to become part of more than just one or two circles of friends, to branch out and make a conscious effort to enhance your intellectual empathy. Students in my anthropology course often tell me that though the ethnographic research is one of the most challenging projects they've ever completed, it is also one of the most rewarding. They take pride in the fact that they successfully became part of a group they didn't think would welcome them at first, or a group they didn't believe they would fit into. They also talk about becoming more aware of how valuable campus diversity is when they explain what they learn by being around people who think about things from another perspective. The quote by author Jacqueline Woodson that I saw on the back of some of your t-shirts yesterday is worth repeating here. Quote, diversity is about all of us and about us having to figure out how to walk through this world together, end quote. Being together at IWU does not mean we have to be the same. It means we have to learn how and why we differ, what our differences mean, and why they matter. Intentionally seeking opportunities for enhancing our understanding of one another will help us create a campus where we all feel comfortable sharing our thoughts and experiences and where we all feel at home. I look forward to seeing you at some of the lectures, films, concerts, teach-ins, and workshops on campus. African Culture Night, a debate about the upcoming election, a talk on women in science, many of which are designed specifically to expand our knowledge about each other and to enhance our understanding of ourselves in relation to others. The goal is to use this knowledge and understanding to make IWU, play, to IWU a place for each of us to thrive and to become the best versions of ourselves. Being open to making a friend out of a stranger, becoming a member of a group you couldn't imagine yourself belonging to, and taking a class that seems like a major diversion could set you on a path that you have never expected to be on, but one that could quite possibly change your life for the better. So let the adventure begin. Let's rock our worlds together at IWU. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you for the millionth time, and perhaps you'll have a million more. It's my pleasure as your Dean of Students to help be part of your journey and certainly to encourage you to move from that place of feeling like an outsider to being an insider as part of orientation and turning typing. It is also my pleasure of your Dean of Students to provide a lot of different types of opportunities to help rock your world. <laughs> I'm charged in my role with advocating for you and your experience, for helping you to achieve your best success and for creating a dynamic, inclusive campus community with deep roots. Today is the beginning of many of those things. Tonight we gathered at the Aspiration Fountain as the beginning of a shared experience, a shared experience of thinking about your goals and aspirations. And while we may talk about goals today, the reality is that that's a bit too grounded. Goals reflect priorities, priorities reflect values, values reflect purpose, Purpose inspires dreams, and dreams fulfill our calling and our mission. The Aspiration Fountain is appropriately named. Aspiration invites reflection and an invitation to create public goals. Aspiration requires action. You must be actively engaged in achieving your dreams. Aspiration inspires success. 
Your dreams are surrounded by the dreams of others, and they are nurtured, strengthened, and encouraged. These lofty goals call on you to find, develop, and pursue your passion. Be a citizen of the world with your leadership, diversity, and engagement. Be open-minded and explore your values. Take stock in who you are. All messages you've already heard tonight. But for this week and perhaps this semester, there are some more specific goals as you go into orientation. Number one, play the dorky icebreakers. Do it anyway. Nothing unites your class like common dorkiness. It's okay. We love it. Participate in Mission Day, a day that continues to reinforce our university mission and key commitments. Have a heated conversation about something that matters to you. Develop genuine friendships with someone different from you. Ask for help. Perhaps something you haven't had much practice at. Get to know Bloomington Normal and find ways to contribute to this community, not just the Wesleyan community inside the bubble, but the bigger world outside the bubble as well. Meet someone new every day this week. In the spirit of getting to know one another, let me be bold and tell you a little bit about your roughly 470 new classmates, which is hard to do because you know yourselves pretty well. But based on what the admissions folks are telling us, you come from 21 different states, and feel free to shout out if I mention something familiar to you, from Arizona, anyone, thank you, <laughs> Pennsylvania, to Louisiana, and many points in between. You come from 13, 13 different countries, Bangladesh, Chile, China, <laughs> Ethiopia, Germany, India, Malaysia, and Morocco, just to name a few. You are interested in pursuing 45 different majors. and. Almost 15% of you are still undecided, and we love you for that. <laughs> 70 of you have a close friend or family member who attended Illinois Wesleyan. That makes you a legacy. Where are you, my legacy? And there are 56 of you who are first-generation college students in this class, making you the first <laughs> Like being in Disney World. 
Someone who completed a summer internship at the U.S. Embassy in Brussels. Someone who is a Taekwondo black belt. Someone who placed in the top 15 in a national chess competition. And last but not least, the newest member of our, our IT staff who fixed a computer that the Geek Squad said could not be fixed. <laughs> that you are here. Today marks the beginning of that college career with some important symbolism. Again, you connected at the Aspiration Fountain to declare your goals and to think about the things you hope to accomplish. In the next few minutes, you will sing the alma mater together, which marks the experience that we will have in common. Okay, you can do it, I promise. Well, and that experience here at Wesleyan, is what we have in common. After we close, you will gather at the Kemp Commencement Plaza for a class photo, a photo that marks the beginning and forecasts the future. In four years, this class, these classmates, will gather again on Kemp Plaza. No, in fact, this class will gather, but you indeed will be different. Maybe not in name or background, but you will be forever changed by your education, your friendships, and your experiences. You will be changed by your goals, your priorities, your values, your dreams, and your passions. And as one of my graduates said a couple of years ago, I think my freshman self would be very proud of the person that I have become. Take stock in who you are so you can celebrate who you are becoming. Please rise and join your classmate, Andrew Johnson, class of 2020, for the singing of the alma mater. 